What comes to mind when you think of nationalism? If you're from the so-called first world, it's likely to be some pretty bad dudes like Mussolini, Franco, a certain similar historical figure whose name I unfortunately cannot say because it could get this video deleted, and more contemporary white hot spheres of pure age such as Donald Trump, Marine Le Pen, Pauline Hansen, and Nigel Farage. <laughs> Racism, hatred, exclusion, repression, militarism, there's really just not much good to say about those nationalist figures, though I imagine their very, very large brained followers may disagree. So is that it then? Is nationalism just always that sort of thing? Well, not quite. <laughs> If you're from a post-colonial or so-called third world nation, nationalism might mean something entirely different to you. Rather than negatives, it often, but not always, has more positive connotations. Political movements that prioritise workers' rights and well-being, that push for economic and political independence from the neo-colonial influence of more powerful nations, that validate and promote authentic national culture rather than just trying to emulate that of the USA or Europe, and somewhat paradoxically, considering what the word nationalism literally implies, they also tend to promote unity with other post-colonial nations the world over, emphasising common interests and historical struggles rather than differences. So totally different to the nationalists mentioned earlier, who tend to frame anyone who's even a little bit different to them as some sort of existential threat to the nation. Despite that, it's not hard to find people who may have good intentions saying things like, all nationalism is bad which in the context that they might have in mind may very well be true. But this is a problem, because by using nationalism as a virtual synonym for conservative, far-right, or, well, fascist, the often very distinct post-colonial nationalists are then lumped in with those, uh, swell folks. And plenty of dishonest actors, also known as centrists, are taking advantage of this to delegitimize popular political movements in the Global South that don't entirely submit themselves to the will of designated daddies, such as the USA and Europe. And this is kind of easy for them to do because they just rely on the fact that most people don't really take an in-depth look at international politics. So most of us are probably just going to read one article or one comment on it somewhere, and that's going to be all that we know about it. And then we accept this false equivalence without really looking into it much further. But we've got to actually pay some mind to other parts of the world. We need to be more precise with our terminology to avoid falling into the common trap of US and Eurocentrism. Otherwise, we might inadvertently end up helping John International Monetary Fund and Jeff World Bank in their quest to delegitimize popular movements and install agreeable, multinational friendly, yes-men leaders in the presidency of every single post-colonial nation. So here I am to talk about how a lot of post-colonial nationalism is actually kind of okay. Before that though, I want to acknowledge that it's not all sunshine, lollipops and rainbows. There's still some questionable post-colonial nationalism. The three big modern examples are Hindu nationalism, Chinese nationalism and Indonesian nationalism. The Hindu nationalism of Indian President Modi is just as vile, racist and exclusionary as much of the nationalism in the first world. Like Trump, he's emboldened his supporters who are of the demographic majority, to more openly hate Muslims and other minorities, and has taken even worse direct action against them, such as recently stripping Muslim-majority Kashmir of its autonomy, and threatening to revoke the citizenship of millions of Muslim Indians. Contemporary Chinese nationalism is used to stifle any criticism of the state, not just at home, but also abroad, and to justify an increasingly authoritarian surveillance state that's trying its hand at the same sort of neo-colonialism as present-day Western empires. It also pressures its minority groups to assimilate into the Han majority, to the extent that millions of Uyghur Muslims are currently in prison for the terrible crime of having their own culture and identity. Indonesian nationalism is essentially a colonialist project in of itself. The idea of a united Indonesian identity is a relatively recent concept, only dating back about 100 years, and for many Indonesians it's not nearly as important as their much older regional identities. This identity is also disproportionately influenced by Javanese culture, and Indonesian politics is dominated by Javanese people and ideals. When people are deemed not to adequately conform with it, such as with the Chinese Indonesian minority, they suffer dire consequences. And if there's any talk of an island or region thinking about self-determination or control of their own resources, Jakarta sends in the troops to brutally force its people to remain Indonesian, like in Timor in the past, and in West Papua, literally right now. 
So that's obviously all not very great, to say the least. But I think it's important that I present the bad first, to emphasize the fact that just like in the so-called Western world, people elsewhere have agency. And sometimes some of them are drawn in and end up supporting some downright heinous political movements, just like what occasionally happens to your compatriots at home, or maybe even to yourself. What about the less bad or even good nationalism though? Well, I'm glad I asked myself that question because it's exactly what I wanted to talk about next. Firstly, pretty much every country that ever fought for and won its independence from colonialism or from terrible post-independence regimes did so with nationalism as the primary driving force. This is especially true of the many anti-colonial national liberation movements of the early to mid 20th century. Here's some of them. Vietnam, where Vietnamese nationalists fought against Japan and France to win their independence in 1945, who then channeled that same nationalism to fight off the USA and its South Vietnamese puppet regime in the Vietnam War to definitively unite the country. Cuba, where nationalists of various motivations struggled for independence for decades in the late 19th century before their war was hijacked by the USA, who then replaced Spain as the colonial overlord. They turned Cuba into a dependent client state by demanding that the USA be given special rights, such as the right to invade Cuba whenever it wished, in the Cuban constitution itself. The latter 1959 Cuban revolution against the pro-US Batista dictatorship was also nationalist in nature. It was spurred by the common desire for an independent Cuba that was run by Cubans for Cubans, rather than as a casino for rich Americans and local landowners who treated workers like slaves. The primary intellectual influence on its leaders was, contrary to popular belief, not Karl Marx, nor Mao, nor Stalin, but rather the 19th century Cuban nationalist hero, Jose Marti, who is still venerated there today. Canada and the USA, where I'd argue that many Native American people seeking self-determination are driven by a form of nationalism. There's been a lot written about Cherokee nationalism, for example, and I don't think that anyone could possibly argue against them in good faith. And different Native American peoples also express solidarity with one another due to common anti-colonial struggles. Such as in 1990, during the ochre crisis in Canada, where different Native American peoples travelled from across North America to help the Mohawk people, who have themselves frequently been described as nationalists, defend their land against the government of Quebec. Their struggle inspired movements worldwide. It's even been credited with helping to inspire indigenous activist movements as far away as in Bolivia, which eventually led to Evo Morales being elected as their first indigenous president. And South Africa, in which the inclusive nationalist African National Congress, who you might be most familiar with through Nelson Mandela, fought against the exclusionary white nationalism of a government, which enforced minority rule for 80 years and apartheid for 50 years before it was finally toppled in 1994. African nationalism, based on the pursuit of national sovereignty and ethnic equality in post-colonial African nations, was the most important part of the ANC's ideology. This was eventually enshrined in Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela's call for post-apartheid South Africa to be a rainbow nation for all peoples. Secondly, there's a lot of more recent positive nationalist movements and leaders. I'm going to use examples from Latin America because there's actually a whole lot of them there who are all very much into international unity, which really drives home just how different they are to the racist nationalist in the global north. And also because Latin American nations in general are like really nationalistic. Like if you thought the flag worship and all that sort of stuff in the USA was incredibly weird, you'd probably be surprised to learn that there's possibly even more flags on display per square meter in countries like Argentina, Peru, and Venezuela, and that every single neighborhood plaza has a grand statue of one of the same regional heroes, with a plaque reading something to the tune of Glory to the Fatherland. This sentiment is so strong that even new liberal governments have to hide their true agenda behind a nationalist facade, otherwise they just wouldn't have much chance of being elected. This happened most recently with Lenin Moreno in Ecuador, who is mostly known on the international stage for booting Julian Assange out of the Ecuadorian embassy and delivering him to waiting police. But he also ran as a nationalist social democrat and then went full vende patria and sold the country off to the IMF the second that he got into the presidency. That's something that I feel that more people should probably know. Anyway, so there's been a bunch of recent leaders in South America who have all been a kind of similar breed of more positive post-colonial nationalists. Evo Morales in Bolivia, Cristina and Nestor Kirchner in Argentina, Ulrich Silva in Brazil, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, 
Rafael Correa in Ecuador, those are some of the big ones. Now these movements aren't all exactly the same by any means. Bolivia is a very different country to Argentina, which is very different to Brazil, which is very different to Ecuador. You get the idea. Some are also more radical than others. But regardless of these differences, the nationalisms that they espouse are all very similar. They embrace and promote their own culture and self-belief in the capabilities of their countrymen. They assert that their people are perfectly capable of making things better for themselves without needing to change the fit a model prescribed by or based on Europe or North America. That means rejecting the common idea that the only way to progress is to uncritically adopt the free market capitalism, deregulation and destruction of workers' rights that's demanded by Euro and US centric institutions like the International Monetary Fund and World Bank as well as their rich local supporters who are at best disconnected from, and at worst just don't care about, the reality faced by most of their compatriots. It also involves acknowledging the very real histories of exploitation and political meddling by these foreign powers and institutions, and at least, on the face of it, trying to make sure that it doesn't continue. And don't forget, we're not talking about faraway historical abstractions here. The USA, the IMF, and the World Bank all backed murderous dictatorships in these countries just one or two generations ago, and they still actively try to meddle in their internal politics pretty much whenever possible. So essentially, it's a nationalism that says that self-belief, self-assertion, and self-rule are the way forward. That their countries should be run to benefit the majority of people who actually live there, and that they're perfectly capable of doing that all themselves. Thank you very much. These nationalists are also not just nationalists. This is very different to what you might expect from the literal meaning of nationalist, especially if you're more used to the exclusionary nationalism of the first world. But they actually strongly promote regional integration and solidarity. Many of them even incorporate the concept of patria grande, the idea that one day all of Latin America should be united into one big country. This is very different to the sort of solidarity shown between, say, white nationalists in different countries. They only care about unity between whoever they might deem to be white to the exclusion of all others. In contrast, the solidarity between these nationalists goes well beyond simple ethnic lines to instead emphasize what they have in common despite such differences. Bolivia is majority indigenous, Brazil has a different primary language and has a larger and more culturally influential Afro-descended population than many of its neighbors, Argentina is majority European descended, and Ecuador and Venezuela are majority mestizo, which means people who are of mixed European and indigenous ancestry. So ethnically, and in some cases linguistically, these countries aren't actually all that similar. But rather than focus on superficial physical differences, they instead find common ground in their opposition to economic exploitation, shared colonial histories, and the things that actually are similar about their cultures. So despite all these movements being very much nationalistic, they are nationalistic in a very emancipatory and inclusive way. Now I'm not saying that any of these nationalist leaders and movements are perfect or anything. They all have their issues and aren't anything close to what I would consider my own personal political ideal, which wouldn't even have a leader. But they're still far far better than the neoliberal alternatives, and not even remotely comparable to what generally passes for nationalism in the global north. But there is another different type of so-called nationalism in Latin America. One that you're probably familiar with if you happen to read the news every now and again. It's pretty much the polar opposite of what I just described, and Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro is its contemporary manifestation. I kind of hesitate to call him and other figures like him nationalists though. In truth, Bolsonaro pretty much just hates everything about Brazil that makes it Brazil. Rather, his nationalism, emphasis on the air quotes, embraces everything about the colonizer and nothing about the colonized. He believes his own people to be inferior and in need of bringing up to the level of the supposedly superior, mostly European descended upper class, something that is to be achieved through forcing on everyone his imported brand of evangelical Christianity. That's pretty much exactly how the Spanish and Portuguese colonizers justified their subjugation of indigenous people and African slaves in the Americas, though they were just boring, bog standard Catholics rather than fancy new millenarian evangelicals. You can clearly see his disdain for many Brazilians in his open racial hatred, but doubly so in the fact that he complains about samba and carnival, and seems to think that there's some sort of decadent satanic things that need to be stopped. Samba, carnival, 
How could anyone claim to be a Brazilian nationalist and openly hate one of Brazil's most well-known authentic cultural productions? I don't know. Bolsonaro shares this self-hating so-called nationalism with many of the US-backed South American dictatorships of the very recent past, including the one in his own country, Brazil, but also those of Argentina, Chile and Uruguay, while brutally repressing the vast majority of people, rewriting history to frame the anti-colonial nationalist movements mentioned earlier as devious and destructive, and trying to force their people to assimilate into a constructed identity that was religiously justified but ultimately just a European ideal, they implemented free market shock treatment and effectively just sold their countries off to the highest bidder, much like Bolsonaro is doing. Heard about the Amazon lately? <laughs> We're in big trouble. This is not nationalism in the same sense as Brazilian nationalism, or Argentine nationalism, or Chilean nationalism. Rather, it's just settler colonial people taking their settler colonial roots to the extreme, with an ideology indistinguishable from that of the colonial empires of hundreds of years ago, which is not really specific to any one country. If anything, this could maybe be said to be some sort of Christian nationalism or settler colonial nationalism, or well, really just the bog standard sort of fascism that's common in Latin America, which I happen to have another video on if you want to check that out. So Bolsonaro and his aspirations are not nationalists in the sense that the emancipatory nationalists in post-colonial nations are, not in their validation of the local culture, nor in their drawing the overwhelming majority of their support from the working class, nor in their desire for self-determination, and especially not in the whole not being fascist part. So there you have it, that's just a taste of some different types of nationalisms than what you might be used to. Now let's put some more thought into what we're saying before we throw out the term as some sort of blanket negative and end up delegitimizing by proxy some actually kind of not so bad nationalist movements in the post-colonial world. A lot of the time people who are using nationalism to refer to the shitty nationalists whether they be Bolsonaro style or Trump style, should really just be saying fascism or neo-fascism. Because the only thing that's stopping those guys from being full-on fascist dictators is that they aren't yet capable of doing so. And I sure hope it stays that way. So that's the end of the video folks, thanks for watching. If you liked it, please consider subscribing and checking out some of my other videos. If you really like my content, maybe consider donating me some money on Patreon. You can get some rewards like early access to my videos for just $1, or your name showing up in these here credits for $5. I'm trying to make YouTube into my full-time job and every little bit that you can give me helps with that so much. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of my amazing patrons for their support, and especially the following from the $10 and up tiers. Leftist Tech Support, Key to the Fields, Inga Leonora, Kira B, Industrial Robot, Diego A. Salvati, Sinceone Bresgal, Lee Caratash Gullet, Alejandro, Matatesta, Jamie the Commie, Tija, The Antifada, BJ Hansen, and Daniel S. That's all. Bye.